See, after the discussion about electric field and electric intensity and all that, Gauss's law becomes really a conceptual topic. But this law is very useful, as you're going to see. We will not do any problems today because it's going to be filled with concepts, which means you have to try to listen as much as possible. We already know that positive charge is the standard charge that we take, isn't it? Positive charge. So let's say there is a positive charge here. If you had another charge close to it, definitely it will be repelled by it, isn't it? It will be repelled and if it could move, then it would move along this path, run away from it. Now, if you had put this, let's call it the test charge somewhere here, then it would have gone along this path. So what you see here is an electric field. This is how the electric field looks like when you have an isolated positive charge. Okay? And let's imagine that there is a sphere around the charge. This is imagination. We're coming into Gauss law. Just imagine that there is a sphere around this. Are there electric lines of force passing through this? Are the electric lines passing through this imaginary surface? Yes. Now take a look at this. Now, what is your idea when you see such lines? What kind of field does it represent? You see the electric lines in this case? The electric lines are all pointing in one direction, right there, and they are at equal distance. So it's a constant electric field. So a uniform electric field is always represented by lines that are equidistant from each other. Right? Parallel to each other. Correct. At the same distance and parallel to each other. But the point here is, you see a surface kept in this field. And this line that you see, brownish line, is a line drawn at right angles to the surface. It's a line drawn. So if this was the surface, then you have this drawn. Because it's 3D, I hope you understood, right? And the angle, whenever you take the angle between the electric field and the surface, you always take the angle with the perpendicular drawn to the surface. So you have to get that into your mind. Normally what happens is, when you, when you let's say, let me use this. When you have a surface here and you have the lines like that, lines like that, and if I ask you, what is the angle between the surface and the line, you would say 90, 90 degrees, but never. From now on, it is zero degrees. Why? Because if that's the electric line, and that's the surface, you always take the angle, not with the surface, but with the perpendicular drawn to the surface. Is that making sense? So if that's the perpendicular, and that's the electric line, they are parallel, so the angle is zero. But if the surface was this way, and the lines are this way, right, same as before, then the perpendicular drawn is like this, so the angle would be 90. Now, it's very difficult to keep that in your mind because you're so much used to giving angles the other way. But let this be fixed in your mind. So as you see here, the angle is theta. And therefore, the electric flux passing through it, phi E, shows electric flux. Okay? Electric flux means a set of electric lines, a group of electric lines of force, like I've shown. Now, the total electric flux passing through it is the dot product of E and A. What is E? Intensity. Is an intensity a vector? Yes, it is. And area here is also a vector. <coughs> Why? The direction of area, look at this figure again. What does this arrow represent? It gives you the direction of the area. So when you take the dot product, did you know that when you take the dot product, you get A, B, cos theta. A dot B is equal to A, B, cos theta. should know that. Therefore, electric flux is given by E, A, cos theta. 
Okay, again, what is phi E? It is the electric flux passing through the surface. Electric flux passing through the surface. Okay, now that's easy to understand. Let me ask you this. If theta was 90 degrees in that diagram, if theta was 90 degrees, how much electric flux was, would pass through it? If that has 90 degrees, then the surface is like this, isn't it? <coughs> because the perpendicular is upwards. Okay, how much electric flux passes through it? Zero. Zero. And that is very clear, because cos 90 is... There you go. So that's the formula for electric flux passing through a surface. Now, we're going to use this concept to understand Gauss's law. Okay. Gauss's law states that, you know how you read that? You have to read that as closed integral. That means when you integrate over a surface, you start from a point and go back to it. You, it's a closed integral. E dot dA, I should have put vectors, is equal to Q by epsilon naught. There, the whole thing. Now, on the left-hand side, what do you see on the left-hand side? I think you know this. Let's take it one by one. Do you know what this is? Well, it is the total electric flux, isn't it? Yes. The unit of electric flux, which you will understand soon, is this. Newton times meter squared by coulomb. Okay, so the left-hand side is the total electric flux passing through any surface. And the right-hand side is the charge inside the surface. Very important point. That's why I have written enclosed charge. That means if you have a, a surface, you have a lot of charge outside, you don't have to care about it. You only look at the charge inside the surface. See, these are crucial points. And epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space. It's a constant. Good, if you know it, it's 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. Don't try to cram the units, because I'll soon show you how to get the units, okay? So that is Gauss law. What's Gauss law? The total electric flux passing through a closed surface is 1 by epsilon naught times the total charge inside the surface. That is Gauss law. It will make more sense as we try to apply this. Let's try to apply Gauss law to a particular case. Now what I've drawn here is, I assume that there is a point charge right at the center, although I've not shown it. You can draw a point charge here, a positive charge. How do I know it's positive? Because all the lines are going out from it. So, and what you see here is an imaginary surface. There's no real sphere there. It's an imagination. It's an imaginary sphere. We're going to apply Gauss law, and soon it will make a lot of sense. According to Gauss law, E dot dA is equal to, in this case, wait. Let's take any point on the sphere. Be with me. Isn't it going to be at equal distance from the point charge, which is at the center? Correct? Mm -hmm. Therefore, wouldn't E be a constant? At all these points, wouldn't the intensity be a constant? Because the point charge is here. And at equal distance, the intensity is going to be the same. So you can take out E out of the integration. And then what you have is closed surface integral dA. What is closed surface integral dA? The surface area of a sphere. Uh, which is 4 pi r squared. You see how that happens? So you take the intensity out. And then integral dA is 4 pi r squared because it's a sphere. Therefore, E times 4 pi r squared, what's, what's on the right-hand side of Gauss law? Q over, Q over epsilon naught. That's what I've written here. Easy. So now we can make E the subject. And you get simple math. All right. Q by 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. 
Look, we have used Gauss law to find the intensity due to a point charge. Do you realize that? Intensity due to a point charge is simply given by this formula. And what I'll do is, you know, actually 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught can be removed and I'm going to call it K. We have already called it K. Do you remember that? 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught is K. So that can be written, well, that's when the title comes up. Okay, that can be written as E is equal to K Q by 4 pi r squared. I don't know if I have written or not. Let's see. That is the positive charge, okay? Q by the center, yes. KQ by r squared. Where K is? Four by epsilon. No. Nine, nine, Definitely that's the number, but K is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught. K is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught. That, of course, is 9 times 10 to the 9. Isn't it? Okay. The second one. Now let's consider a spherical conductor. When I say a spherical conductor, uh, try to understand the diagram because it's all together. It's a thin sphere. Now it's not imaginary. It, there is a real sphere. But it's made of a conductor like copper or aluminum or whatever. It's not so thick and in, inside it's hollow. Are you getting one? Inside is hollow and it carries a charge as shown in the diagram. It's, it is carrying a positive charge and the charge is uniformly distributed all over the surface. It's a thin shell. It's hollow inside and it has a total charge of let's say Q, spread over its surface. Okay? First, let's try to find the intensity inside that sphere. Now pay attention. Because when you try to find the intensity inside the sphere, see this is what I have, I'm going to do. I consider a sphere, an imaginary sphere inside it. Do you see that sphere? Do you see the difference? Well, the sphere carrying the charge is this one. But this is the imaginary sphere inside. Now you tell me, how much charge is there inside that imaginary sphere? How much charge do you have inside that imaginary sphere? Nothing. Therefore, according to Gauss law, the right-hand side becomes zero. Remember that? In Gauss law, the right-hand side, what is the right-hand side to show? Shows Q by epsilon naught. What is Q? The total charge inside the imaginary surface, isn't it? Now, in this case, there is no charge inside the imaginary surface, which means the right hand side is zero. If the right hand side is zero, then what you get is equal to zero. This cannot be zero because it's an area. Therefore, the only E is zero. Make sense? Because if the right hand side is zero, one of them has to be zero. So E is zero. What does that show? There is no electric field inside a charged conductor. There is no electric field inside a charged conductor. I think we discussed this last day. I, I touched on it. I did ask you which is the safest place yeah. during a thunderstorm. I think I gave you under a tree, inside, inside the house, no <laughs> or in a car, which is a metal. Now you see that. It's a metal conductor. Now I just proved that inside that there is no electric field. So the safest place is inside the car. But even if it has no tires. Because remember, it's not the tires. It's gas law applied. Okay, now the second thing. What about if you take a point outside? 
we'll go to that. But first, let me show you. At a point inside, oh, this is at a point outside. Okay. At a point outside, if you take a point outside and you want to find the field at a point outside, what do you do? You imagine a sphere passing through that point. Can you see the other sphere outside? Okay, tell me. Be careful. What is the total charge inside that sphere, that imaginary sphere? I'm just asking you, what is the total charge inside the imaginary sphere? Remember, this is the imaginary sphere, isn't it? This is the imaginary sphere because we are trying to find the intensity at this point, maybe. Okay. And don't you see that all of the charge on this thing is inside that sphere? Don't you see that? Yeah. Why make it rough? It's so easy. Because we have a sphere outside. Isn't all the charge on this inside that imaginary sphere? Come on. Right? Yes. So what is the formula you're going to get? Surprising. E dot dA is equal to, again, E times 4 pi R squared. Same thing, isn't it? Wait, what, what is the R there? Is it the radius of the sphere or the radius of the imaginary surface? Be careful. <laughs> radius of the imaginary surface. Not the radius of the sphere. Radius of the imaginary surface. Okay, that is R. Therefore you will get E is equal to same as before. You get the same form as before. Exactly the same. Which is KQ by R squared. You know how students miss on this? Because you only see the math. Now let me show you this. There is a point charge here. Watch this. And here you have this particular case. And then you have taken an imaginary sphere. See these two cases? Let's say this point charge is Q, and this total charge, as in this case, was Q. And you have taken a point which is R distance away. Here you have taken a point which is R distance away. What do you say about the intensity due to both these cases? We call this P, and this is S. What about the intensity at P and S? These are two totally different situations. Do you notice? Yeah. What do you have here? A point. A point charge. What do you have here? Uh, the same charge, but distributed on a sphere. But the formula for intensity that you got is the same. same. Which means, for all practical purposes, if you have a charge distributed on a conductor, you can imagine that it is situated at its center. That is the application. If you don't get that, you missed it. So although the charge was on a sphere, you need not go about, you know, trying to look at the sphere and all that. You just imagine that all the charge was at its center. center. Finished. That is how Gauss law makes things easy. Concentrated at its center. Okay. We did look at this. And I was teaching it backwards, but it's okay. You know what I mean? Because first we discussed this. At a point inside, I told you that the enclosed the charge is zero. Therefore, E is zero, which means there is no field inside a charged spherical shell. Okay. I want to change something. I just want to change something. Now let's imagine that, watch, instead of being a hollow sphere, it's a solid sphere. You know the difference, don't you? It's a solid sphere, but it's a conductor. It's a solid sphere, a conductor. What do you say about the field inside? Again, it's zero. You know why? Because as soon as you charge a conducting sphere, even if it's solid, all the charges will move to the outside. Because it's a conductor. Why do you call it a conductor? Because there are free electrons, right? So the free electrons, you, you might have tried to give it a charge inside, it's not going to stay there. 
So very important point, whenever you charge a conductor, the charges are always going to be on its surface. When you charge a conductor, this is going to come back again when we do alternating currents and very important at that time. Charges always go and get on as far away as possible, which means it will be on the surface. So that's why I wrote same result for solid conductor or conducting sphere. Since the charges lie at the surface. Get it. Okay, what if it's a solid sphere which is charged and it's non-conducting? Now instead of one time, it's a second time. Solid sphere of charge which is non-conducting and that's what you see on the board. Well, huh. you know what? Yes, I took the radius as R0. I was correct, isn't it? I took it as R0. Do you see the sphere? Mm -hmm. Brownish in color, positive charge spread out. And first of all, I'm taking a point inside. Isn't that what we just did now? A point inside, you can see the imaginary sphere there, which I've drawn. Okay. But uh, I started writing for points outside first. So shall we do that first? Okay. Don't get confused. If it's a point outside, then you have to consider a sphere outside passing through that point. Is there going to be any difference in this case? Wouldn't it just be the same as before if it's outside? Come on. Isn't it still going to be E is equal to KQ by yeah. R squared? Why? Because all the charge is inside that sphere, isn't it? Okay, so that's just one sentence. Now for points inside. For points inside, you consider that sphere, oh, sorry, this sphere, S, and we consider that rho is the charge density, or density of charge, and rho is defined as the total charge divided by 4 by 3 pi r naught cube. Uh, r naught. That's r naught cube, okay? That is r naught cube. Now the charge enclosed this. The ratio of the volumes, which is what I'm writing now. Yes. I wrote it a little different, but the same thing. Okay. Now when you apply Gauss law, the left hand side is E times 4 pi r squared, which is the surface area of the sphere, remember? It's Q enclosed by epsilon naught. Which is KQ by r naught cube times r, which is the same thing that we got, actually. Because I replaced it by a K, and also remember that I had to bring this 4 pi r squared and all that stuff to the right side. You see this? I have not written that there. So this had to go to the right side, denominator. Okay. So that is the formula. You can remember it this way. Isn't, isn't it much easier to remember it this way? Yeah. K Q by r naught cube r. And let's uh, discuss this equation a little bit. Tell me. If you draw a graph between intensity and distance, will you get a straight line? Think before you answer. Like, you take R on the x-axis. Wait a minute. If R is zero, what's the intensity? That means, even in this case, what's the field right at the center? Zero, isn't it? Right at the center is zero because R is zero. Okay. And as R increases... Is E going to increase? Definitely. Are they proportional to each other? Are you going to get a straight line? What's the equation for a straight line? Y is equal to mx plus c. Do you remember the equation for a straight line? So that means this is going to be the slope of that line. And aren't all these constants? Look, they're all constants. K, Q. This is the radius of the sphere. All constants. That's going to be the slope. So I can ask you on the exam. 
If you, you have to remember, the slope is this. Is it going to be a straight line? Yes. Inside, the intensity is going to change in the form of a straight line. Keep that in mind. I have not written that, but it's an important point. As we have the graph of potential and intensity, but we'll look at potential later on. And it's a spherical conductor. Okay, there it is. The entire diagram. Isn't that the kind of diagram that we drew? But what's given there is the graph of uh, potential, actually. See, this is the graph. It, doesn't it say voltage? Yeah. yeah, it's the graph of potential. There is a slight difference between these two graphs. Look at the formula. Look at the formula for potential. Do you notice any difference in the formula for potential? Uh-uh. Come on. There is no R squared. It's just... And I'm going to tell you why, right now. And that's why the slopes of these two lines will be different, potential and intensity, the graphs. See, the slopes will be different. The R squared one will fall faster, because it's R squared. Graph of potential and intensity. What is an infinite plane sheet of charge? What do you mean by it's infinite? What, what's a plane sheet? Come on. Something like this, right? But is this infinite? So that means you have to imagine something that extends to infinity in all directions, okay? And I can only draw a part of it, sorry. I don't know anybody who can draw all of it. So, and it has charges. Excuse me. Assume that it's positive. That is the sheet of charge, and the charges are distributed uniformly. Okay. <coughs> what are we trying to do? We are using Gauss law to do what? To find the intensity of field, isn't it? I'm going to tell you at the, the beginning itself, before we use any math, will you believe me if I say this? This is the plane sheet of charge. And if you take a point very close here like this, and take another point here, I'm going to tell you that the intensity at these two points are the same. Do you believe me? But I'm going to show it mathematically. Now, the, the, the reason why you don't believe me is because you forgot that this is infinite. And before the math, let me tell you this. If you stand close to the surface, this white wall here, look at it. Very close. You only see a small part of it, right? What if you move further away? So you are affected by a bigger region, which compensates for the increase in distance. It's cool. Why? Because the area of a circle is pi r squared, isn't it? The circle becomes bigger and your distance is increasing and the intensity falls by r squared. The area increases by r squared and the intensity, so both compensate each other. But now we're going to get it mathematically using Gauss law. At least now you have an idea, you have to... Mathematically, now we have to prove that the intensity does not depend on the distance. Okay, here we go. As you see on the diagram, more imagination. We are trying to find the intensity at a particular point. Let me complete this. The, uh, try to correct it. Oh, stop. I am trying to find the intensity at this point. Eee. Right here. Do you see that? Intensity at this point. Come on. I'll give you time to draw this. Now what you have to do is, you have to imagine that there's a cylinder passing through the surface. I know this is technically, it doesn't even look like a cylinder, so it's tough. Okay. Now, this is a cylinder passing through the surface. 
with that point on one of its end faces. Do you know that a cylinder has two end faces and a curved surface? Thank you. So that point is on one of its end faces. Now I need your help and we're going to finish this in two minutes. At this point, what is the angle? We're looking at the end face. Everybody look at the end face. What's the angle between the electric field at that point and that surface? What is the angle? What is the angle, one more time, what is the angle between the electric field at that point and that surface? Remember, when you take the angle, you do not take it with the surface, but you take it with the perpendicular drawn to the... Isn't this the perpendicular drawn to the surface? Yes. yes. Isn't that the same as the direction of the field? Yes. So what's the angle? Zero. And cos zero is one. But, well, the same thing at the other end phase. But when you take the curved surface, let's go to the curved surface. The intensity, I mean the lines are this way, isn't it? But because it's a curved surface, when you draw the perpendicular, it's going to be upwards. As I have shown here, do you see this? What's the angle now? 90. And therefore cos 90 is? What does that mean? That means no electric field passes through the curved surface, isn't it? Come on. No, no electric flux passes through the curved surface. That is Gauss law. In this case, you have two end phases. And so the total area is 2 dA. And Q is sigma dA. The dA's cancel out. Rearrange, you get E is equal to sigma by 2 epsilon naught. This shows that the intensity does not depend on the distance from the plane sheet of charge. Okay. Field due to two plane sheets of charge. All right, those are the two plane sheets. One is positive and the other is negative. Let's assume that both have the same surface density when you take a point outside here, outside the plates, the field due to the positive plate is going to be away. The field due to the negative plate is going to be towards. You make sense, right? Therefore, the intensity here being equal in magnitude, opposite in direction, cancels out. But when you take a point inside between the plates, intensity due to the positive plate is away. Intensity due to the negative plate is towards it which means it's in the same direction. Therefore, they add up. Therefore, outside, you could say plus sigma by 2 and negative, and so it cancels out. Inside, they add up, being the same direction, and you get sigma by epsilon naught. So, conclusion, intensity is... Remember, what is sigma? Sigma is Q by A, isn't it? Q by A, Q by area. So that's why I wrote that. This is an important application. We're going to get what is called a capacitor. Has anybody heard of a capacitor or a condenser in an electrical circuit? We are building up to the theory of a capacitor. That's why it was concept loaded all this time. But finally, it's going to become a practical working thing. And that's going to be our next lab finding the capacitance of a capacitor. So I have to bring you up to that, where you know what a capacitance is, and then you do some experiments on that. Intensity. Before we define potential, somebody define electric intensity. We've been talking about this for such a long time. At least you know that it's a vector. It has a direction. It's away from a positive charge and towards a negative charge. We know that. How did we define it? We defined it as the force acting on one coulomb, positive one coulomb. Does anybody remember this formula? That is why the unit of intensity was Newton per coulomb. Intensity is a force acting on one coulomb. 
That's why intensity is a vector, because force is a vector. But when we define potential, potential is a scalar. Makes it easy. You never put an arrow on top of that. That would be really silly, because it's a scalar. It's defined as work by charge. See the difference? Work is a scalar. That's why potential is also a scalar. And already because of the definition, you see that the unit is going to be... Help me out. What's the unit of this? What's the unit of work? Joule and coulomb. So it's going to be joule per coulomb, which is also called a volt. So one joule divided by one coulomb is one volt. That is to honor an Italian scientist called Alessandro Volta, who first gave us the electric cell, which you call the battery. The first one, yeah, just imagine how your cell phones would have worked without a battery. He's the one who first gave us an electric battery. That's why Volt. That's the name of a scientist. That's what I'm saying. So, potential is work over charge. Didn't I say that the potential at infinity is considered to be zero? So, if you have, let's say, Q columns, and you want to find the potential at this point, you want to find the potential at this point, which is R distance away, what you have to do is, you have to calculate the work required to bring a plus one coulomb all the way from infinity up to that point. Wait, do you have to do work to bring a positive charge closer to another positive charge? Do you have to do work? Yes. Certainly. Why? Because the force is a force of repulsion. Therefore, the closer you come, the bigger the force of repulsion. Therefore, when you try to find the total work, you will have to integrate. You'll have to integrate the work. Work is force times displacement. So you'll have to go force times dr. But because you're bringing a plus one column, the force is called intensity. Remember that? Force on a plus one column is intensity. So you're going to say, okay, that's potential. So that is integral E dot dr gives you voltage or potential. That's the relation between intensity and potential. You see the relation between intensity and potential? You take the integral of intensity with dr, you get potential. Another way of writing it is this way. You can write it as a differential. You can write E is negative dv by dr. Hold on. I have to put a negative here. Somebody tell me why I have to put a negative here. Because you're doing work against the force, aren't you? So that's why you have a negative here. So voltage is negative E dot dr. Now, there is going to be some confusion here if you don't listen. All this time we were talking about the work that an external force does, isn't it? That's why it's negative. But if you're talking about the work done by this charge, it's going to be a positive. It's just like when you lift this object up from the earth, we, I'm doing work. My work is negative, but if you look at the gravitational potential, it's positive. That makes sense? It's the difference between work done by a system and work done on a system. Okay, so be careful with this negative. But I would suggest, when you talk about a positive charge, the potential is always positive. And for a negative charge, the potential is always negative. That's an easy way to remember. So potential due to a positive charge is positive, and potential due to a negative charge is negative. So if I say that, then we are talking about the work done by the system. That's why I removed the negative sign. Don't get confused. Okay. Just remember, potential due to a positive charge, positive. Due to a negative charge, negative. Remember that. Okay, when you integrate this, let's see what you get. No, wait. Let me complete it without using this. What's E? For a point charge, what is E? Whew, come on, what is E for a point charge? K cubed by R squared. If you integrate K cubed by R squared, you're going to get a negative there. 
I'm going to I'm going to show you one more time. Okay, the work here to bring a positive charge, one coulomb from infinity to R. That is the definition of potential. And when you integrate, integral, you see the limits, infinity to that distance R, kq by R squared dr, because this is E, correct? Isn't that E? Okay. You can take the constants out. What are the constants? K and Q. So what do you have? You have integral 1 by R squared dr. And I put a negative there. So now you will have, when you integrate that, wouldn't you have negative 1 by R? Anybody? What's the integral of 1 by R squared dr? Negative 1 by R. So that's why the two negatives become a positive. So that's why the potential due to a positive charge is positive. The unit of potential is volt. Because you're all so good. But uh, in between, there is something called an equipotential surface here. So there is no repetition. Equipotential surface. What does the word mean? <laughs> hey, look at that word and tell me what do you mean by same potential. same potential. If you join points that are the same potential, you get an equipotential surface. All right. So the definition, if the potential is the same, then it's called an equipotential surface. All points are at the same potential. And I have drawn the equipotential surfaces for a point charge. Positive charge here, what do these lines represent? Electric field, isn't it? Intensity. No, it's going to go away. But do you see the dotted circles, actually they are spheres. Do you see those? Those are equipotential surfaces. So this is an equipotential surface, all the, because they're at the same distance, that's why. You, you see that? Okay, so at all these points the potential is the same. At all these points the potential is the same. But does it mean that the potential here is the same as the potential here? Wait, is the potential here? the same as the potential here? Yeah. No. And if you take the difference in potential divided by the distance, does anybody know what you will get? dV by dr. What does that give? It's on the whiteboard. It gives you intensity. Correct. So that's why the equipotential surfaces are not drawn at equal distances. Watch. What do you know about intensity for those who are listening? What do you know about the intensity here? Very close to the charge. Wouldn't it be much stronger? Yeah. Yes. That is why they, you see that the, the EQ potential surfaces are closer as you get closer there. Okay. EQ potential surfaces get closer as you approach the charge. I was talking about this. dV divided by dr gives you intensity. That's why the EQ potential surfaces are drawn that way. On the right side, you have the EQ potential surfaces due to a dipole. Now, what is the dipole? A positive charge and an equal negative charge. What are the red lines? Electric field. The green dotted lines give you the EQ potential surfaces. You see that? All these points of potentials are the same. So the green lines, dotted lines, show you the EQ potential surfaces due to a dipole. Yes, I am. All right, the equipotentials here, uh, well, this part is a repetition. We already looked at it, right? But look at this. The field, so, uh, can you, I think you can barely see the positive, can you, and the negative. So the electric field lines are from positive to negative, and you have the equipotentials equally spaced. Okay, the last thing is, what is potential energy? What is the relation between potential and potential energy? And potential, we had already talked about it, but I just wanted you to see it one more time. dV is negative E dot dr, or E is minus dV by dr.
as a sentence we could say intensity is the negative you see the negative there negative gradient have you heard this word before gradient yeah negative gradient of potential intensity is the negative gradient of potential and of course you can have three components because intensity is a vector you can have you know that's where the partial differentiation comes in haven't you done <laughs> partial differentiation yeah uh -huh. so there how do you read it do you read it as dou v by d uh, dou x i don't know how you read it how your math professors read it or just read it as dv or you read it as partial differential of right, whatever or you never read it at all <laughs> so you have the three components So remember that intensity is the negative gradient of potential. Okay. That brings us to potential energy. I just told you. The symbol is U. Delta U is Q. Okay, because I had deltas on both sides, okay? Same thing. So the potential at that point, again, the potential at that point is KQ by Okay, Q1 by R, because this time I called it Q1. Are you noticing it? The potential at this point, due to this charge, is KQ1 by the distance. And now, if you have another charge kept there, which is Q2, then its potential energy is Q2 times the potential, which is KQ1 Q2 by R. But specifically, the distance is now called R12. What does that mean? Distance between 1 and 2. So that's the symbol that we're going to be using. So potential energy involves both the <coughs> charges. Potential involves only one charge. That's the difference. Potential energy is k q1 q2 by r12 all this will make sense when we work out problems more sense okay and for all this we are assuming that the potential is zero at infinity isn't it yeah that's the standard the potential is zero at infinity what i'm trying to show here are three charges i should have called it q1 q2 q3 on the vertices of an equilateral triangle, right? Can you give me the potential energy of that configuration? Now, instead of two, you have three. Come on. Well, let me help you. Let me help you. Wait, let me help you. Let's imagine, and please pay attention, imagine that there is no charge here, and you're bringing the first charge from infinity and keeping it here. Are you with me? How much work do you have to do to bring the first one and keep it there? There's nothing else. Do you have to do any work? Nothing, because nothing is opposing you. So, to bring the first one, you don't have to do any work. But, when you bring the second one, remember this is not there, you bring the second one, do you have to do work? Yes. What's the formula for that? K, Q1, Q2 by R12. Hold on a minute. Now when you bring the third one and keep it here, don't you have to do work against both of these? Yes. yes. So wouldn't you get two additional terms? One of them would be K, Q1, Q3 by R13. The other one would, would be K, Q2, Q3 by R23. So what would be the total potential energy of this configuration? It would be the sum of three terms as you're going to see so the potential energy of a configuration is given by k is common for all that so k is taken out q1 q2 by r12 plus q2 q3 by r13 plus q1 q3 by r23 this could have been written as sigma you know what sigma is isn't it summation could have written it like that, but I did not. So, if I had written it as a summation, it would have looked, okay, 
K. Oh, let's see, mark K. Ah. Actually, I could have. K sigma. QI, QJ by R. The electron volt is the energy that an electron acquires when it's accelerated through a potential difference of one volt. And for that, you have to imagine there are two plates, one positive, the other negative, with a potential difference of one volt between them. And you are trying to move an electron from the positive plate to the negative plate. And always one electron volt is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Whenever you do problems, you have to change it into joules. You always have to change it into joules. So thank you so much. This will be online today.